Sick and tired of seeing me? You know, this is the third talk I'm giving this week. Alright, well. <laughs> Alright, I'm glad to have you guys here. So, uh, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the history of cryptography, right? Um, its practical applications today, and like pretty much everything in between, right? So, um, cryptography has a long, long, long history in society. You know, um, even back in the Roman times, you had the basic, one of the most basic ciphers, the Caesar cipher, which is a substitution of three forward, right? So you take a letter C and you go D E F, right? This is a, you know, this substitution, this modulo um, twenty-six addition, is a fundamental part of cryptography. Right, so um, as you go out or as you go through the ages, you end up in about the 16th century um, in Italy, and you have the Viginier cipher, which is um, the next uh, most basic cipher. It's the first example of a passphrase-based cipher, right? Um, and so passphrase-based ciphers um, start with the Viginier. And how a passphrase-based cipher works is you write out um, your passphrase, right? So your passphrase can be long, it can be short, but the longer it is, the more entropy you have. Though this is a mathematically broken cipher, right? You can still have more, uh, more entropy by having a longer passphrase. And you write your message underneath it, and you add the two together, um, and you end up with your encrypted text, right? And this was all well and fine for a while until a clever cryptologist uh, figured out an algorithm to break it every time, right? You figure you start decrypting a message with the presumption that the key length is one. You do um, you do it with the presumption that the key length is two. Presumption that the key length is three, four, so on and so forth, until you are actually able to break the code, or you're able to see um, a different or a pattern of substitutions within it. Right. However, uh, passphrase based cryptography um, does have a place. Right. Um, as we go through the ages, we see in PGP there is uh, path, or you can have a passphrase associated with your private key. Um, that said, um, all this being said, um, I'd like to say, um, since I'm talking about cryptography and tools you can you know, use to secure yourself, uh, cryptography is not a silver bullet, unlike this physical silver bullet here. Uh, cryptography is not. Uh, the, the, biggest er, the biggest risk to your operational security, to your personal security, is human fallibility, right? Um, things, that are out, things that are outside of your control, right? If people snoop in and find out the password, um, you, um, and um, the tools I'm going to talk about won't necessarily protect you from device level key logging. Right, so that's another thing to be aware of. Right, it's still not going to prepare. This is, you know, this isn't covering, you know, your phone antivirus and your computer antivirus stuff. You got to take care of that. Protect yourself from your kids and key login before this is of serious value to you. Right. Um, so um, after we have the Vigineer cipher, we end up with these, uh, with lots of other uh, different hand ciphers, and. and um, and I think about the late 1800s, we start having rotary cipher machines. These are physical machines that have a collection of rotors, right, uh, that would or sometimes have different settings, or basically they would crank out different algorithms, plus this, minus that, <coughs> multiply this, divide that, and it would come up with encrypted text where you would have, um, where you would have to have like rotor settings or some information or an exact copy of that same machine order to be able to cipher it. Um, the best known rotary cipher device was the, um, was the Enigma machine from World War II. The first modern computer was built by Alan Turing um, to break the encryption algorithm of the Enigma machine. Right? So the Enigma machine, it had um, three, er, three wheels on it 
that function as a set uh, function as a setting, right? Basically meaning that um, each wheel um, added or each wheel added a level of entropy, right? Of the entropy level of it, it was two up fifty six, right? Entropy is expressed as a power of expression, right? So if you have a password A B, right, the entropy of it um, is, or in this case actually would be um, because we're dealing with letters, right? If you just use lowercase, um, that's 26, right? Um, if you have lower and uppercase letters, that's 56, right? So basically, to determine your entropy, you determine your character field, right? How broad your character field is, and you determine um, how, it, or like how many times it's being scrambled, right? Uh, via, uh, via a simple substitution, or a or a like um, linear curve substitution or something more complex like that, right? Um, so everybody's got their phone. Or if anybody's, or how's everybody doing with the Wi-Fi here? Up and down. Up and down. Yeah. All right. Well, if you guys, or if any of you guys got signal out right, or signal right now, you know, I'd like to go over a few applications you can use on your phone um, to secure. Your phone, uh, your phone. Um, so for text messages, if you have a, if you have an Android device, there is Text Secure by Open Whisper, Whisper Systems. Um, what that does is it encrypts your text messages locally on your phone. And if you're texting with other Text Secure users, um, either via da data or standard SMS, um, you can set or you can send them encrypted text messages. And this is an open source project. Um, yes. Um, in order of preference, the program se um, selects web-based because that leaves pretty much no trace uh, except for that being pinged out. I mean, if you um, have Tech Secure router through Tor, that's an extra layer of protection. Um, there, then it goes via encrypted, or encrypted SMS, and then its least preferred method is unencrypted SMS. But if you can send an unencrypted SMS, chances are you can send an encrypted SMS. And um, both users have to have the application in order for this to work. Um, then to complement it, this is actually available both on iPhone and Android. There is Signal. Um, that's also by Oprah Whisper Systems. That's the name of it on iOS. And on Android, it is Redphone. Uh, all the, or these applications use a standard set um, set by the NSA. You know, if there's one thing I will give the government credit for, it is zeal of finding out other people's secrets. Right? They're not, or they put out a list of um, of like military grade encryption that is accessible at civilian level, and some of it that is secret. Um, that basically, if they're putting out this list, they're putting it out because or they're putting it out as an advisory for their own security, and if they had a known way to break it, then they probably wouldn't be putting, putting it out there, right? Um, it would be very adverse to their, to their personal interests, because as soon as you know there's a way, way to break a cipher, there, you know there's the possibility that someone out, th out there has discovered this independently of you. Um, that said, um, other, th or other applications, that you can use. Um, there is Wicker, that is cross-platform. Um, they got a per pretty much a perfect score um, from, tech, or from, I believe, TechCrunch's uh, privacy report. So they are really on your side. You can send pictures, video, send pretty much whatever you like through it. Um, and it, it, and it is, um, it's all end-to-end -end encrypted, and it is self-destructing messages. You know, it's, I'd say it's like encrypted Snapchat, basically. Um, and to, you know, to as an accessory to this, um, I would really or I would suggest Tor. You know, it's always great to get Orbot um, on your Android phones. Um, I don't know too much about Tor on iPhone or if it's available. Um, but that said, uh, depending upon the status of your phone, you can set it so that uh, everything routes through it. Um, if you have a rooted phone, right? And I would suggest, or uh, see, depending on your understanding of security, um, rooted phones can present a risk. Um, if you're very security conscious, 
And I would say go ahead and mute your phone if you're not very strongly security conscious then I wouldn't really suggest reading your phone because um, when you root your phone, you allow like programs that, or, or scripts to have, or to like malicious, um, may, they may sometimes maliciously gain, right, that admin, like that top level admin status and interfere or bug or do other bad things to your phone and to your operation security. Um, so, um, who's got questions about Bitcoin? Does anybody have, or is, does everybody here have a Bitcoin wallet so far? All right, we can go on that. Well, so cryptography um, today like expands beyond it. The first modern our digital cryptography pro our protocol was the digital security algorithm that was in the 1950s, and it's gone um, way, way beyond it. You know, there's the advanced encryption standard. Um, and then there's all sorts of hashing that, yeah, sorts of hashing that can be used um, for different methods of verification, right? So um, cryptography is really a science of protocols. It's a science, or it's the, in the modern sense, you take these individual elements, right? You take hashing, you take public-private key cryptography, and you take all these different elements, and you can build them into complex systems, right? Um, the earliest, or like the earliest, like civilian available cryptography was PGP in the 1990s, right? And how that, or how that system works is you have a public key and a private key, right? And how, the equivalent of that is like uh, a mailman having the key for your mailbox to put mail in, but you would see if the or if the letter had been tampered with. Or in this case, you know, they open it and it's just it's like jumble garbage, you know, they can't read it, right? But you have a private key, so you take that in, you know, you take that in our through your or the door into your building, you know, if you live in a big city in a big city like that, and you um, are able to see that message, right? And it is encrypted only for you. Well in addition to this encrypting part <coughs> or encrypting factor of PGP, there's also a signing factor. You can, you, you can use PGP to verify identity. If people keep a PGP key long term, then they can sign it and sign a message and say that's them using a PGP key, right? It's a way, it's a matter of, a, it's a way to authenticate. And it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have, um, necessarily have to be directly associated with you physically, your identity. Um, people can create, or can uh, build identity using PGP anonymously if they feel like it, right? Uh, so PGP or public private key cryptography, the system of having an encrypting key and a decrypting key is used in many protocols, right? Uh, the, our, the, the most popular example here at Portfest being Bitcoin, right? Your, uh, your Bitcoin address, right? How you receive Bitcoin is a public key, right? How you spend Bitcoin is a, uh, is a private key. Right, Bitcoin addresses start with one, Bitcoin private keys start with five. Um, these are actually a hash of your public key, right? Your public key is a lot longer, and your private key is actually sit sign transactions, um, but uh, this is a hash. It's a, sh or I believe, a SHA-256 hash of the, or of the Bitcoin public key itself, right? So a hash is a fixed mathematical process it's done one way, it's like an outline, right? So I, um, so I could outline my shoe, right? Take it away, and then later, if I needed to prove that, like, I knew what that was, I could put my shoe back and say, boom, I've got the original, um, I've got the original data that ends up becoming this, right? And all of this is reliant on a fundamental principle, or a fundamental mathematical principle called P equals MP. And P equals MP uh, basically states that if a problem can be done one way, it should be equally easy to do it the other way. Um, in theory of math, this is true, and this, um, this has to be obeyed, but in order for public private key cryptography and hashing to be legitimate and to work, then we have to presume P is N equal to MP, right? Uh, quantum computing, May be able to solve um, the P, or may be able to make P equal to NP for certain levels of entropy, like lower bit levels. 
But um, that said, it's a lot more exp it's a lot more expensive to build a stronger quantum computer to be higher entropy than to add more bit or random bits of data to create um, a harder pattern to deal with. Right? Um, adding da adding data to something is cheap. Um, adding computing power to a quantum computer is going to be expensive any way you slice it. Um, so, that's it. Um, it's a so basically, the ability to add in a link here, a cache or link here, um, and essentially your password and thing is going to easily outstrip the computing power of any uh, quantum computer capable of breaking that thing anyway. So, it's almost like a race that's not even well started. Pretty much. It's very, it's very unaffordable. Um, to start like a quantum race like that, because at a certain point, right, um, the one or the one side, you know, people who are using cryptography and wanting to keep things private are just going to say, all right, um, we're just going to set, we're just going to set the entropy at a ridiculous threshold that's going to take at least another 100 years to break, and that'll be the end, you know, and that'll like postpone the gateway for another 100 years, at which time like algorithms that are resistant to quantum computing could be developed. Um, if not, if those aren't developed any sooner. Um, so, if you didn't already know, Bitcoin is the most practical use of QR codes. I think I've used QR codes maybe four or five times when it wasn't related to Bitcoin. Um, yeah, side of the Coke can? I don't think I've ever scanned the side of a Coke can. Uh, business cards? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, so Bitcoin, right, use that, like I said, use that public private key compound process for um, setting or for the ad or for the address system and for signing transactions, right? And it also uses hash or it also uses hashing for other purposes. So how many of you understand what mining is? Oh, awesome. How many of you learned this week? That's good. I, would, I would happily hear more details about it, and I know that we'll take you some quick problems about it. Yeah. Um, so mining, right, as a process, um, is or involves doing a lot of or doing a lot of hashes, right? A more, or mathematics that goes one way, right? The three problems that Bitcoin solved that um, prior digital currencies had, right? And all three of these had to be solved in order for you to have a viable and true digital currency. Right, not just like a digital asset that could be revocable and seized at any time. Right, and so those three problems were double spending. Double spending is the biggest problem um, in all pre-Bitcoin digital currencies. Right, um, a few of them had uh, had solved that, but they still had the problem of centralization. Right, if there's a central authority, if there's a central server, somebody can flick it off, um, turn, you know, get rid of it, it's gone. And the third problem is open verification. Right, and so Bitcoin solved all three of these problems. The first problem of double spending is solved by ha or is solved by hashing. When a when a transaction comes through, a hash is generated, and that can be only done one way. Right, it is added to the blockchain, um, and blockchain solves the issue of centralization and open verification. Mining is the process of um, of Bitcoin or er, of Bitcoin miners. Um, trying to figure out if all these transactions coming into the block are legitimate, if they're not double spends, etc., and then to link the, or one block to the previous block with a hash that has at least eight zeros at the start of it. Um, so all this hashing um, adds different or adds layers of security. When you're doing that, you know, you're a merchant. Um, so, if you are, if you trust, you know, the everyday security of the Bitcoin network, then really, um, as soon as a transaction is broadcast, right, as soon as it can be seen that it's or it's come in, and even if it's not included in a block, you can generally trust it. But if you want to be absolutely certain, um, then it's six blocks, because um, if a malicious entity had 51% of the network. Um, they would have 51% chance of getting the first block and doing malicious things with it. 
they would have a 25% chance of doing getting the second block, 12.5% chance, six, six and a quarter, um, and so on and so forth. It's like a reduce. It's like a reducing fraction so um, to a point. Uh, so blocks come in on average every 10 minutes. So yeah. it's one hour, right? Um, but like generally speaking, you're safe with unconfirmed transactions and even like one confirmation uh, for an everyday practical basis. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, risk for merchants, like a uh, risk risk for merchants uh, could be mitigated through, uh, through payment processors who would get or who would counterparty that risk and guarantee it. Why could merchants just mine and put a full note and have a whole copy of the blockchain? Uh, because my, or because um, in order to be or in order to successfully get a block, um, it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of processing power, right? No, I mean like what other person just have a whole copy of the blockchain, so mine is simply just a node, watch, watch all the time, so they can check to see if it does have a structure. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to um, run a full node to see the blockchain. Um, there, a lot of applications have API calls um, for it, like via blockchain.info or their own private means. So that, that should generally be taken care of for you um, as a merchant. say that because um, even, or even though the blocks are 10 minutes, right, um, or the block size could just be increased um, if you really need more on-the-block transactions, right? Uh, but there's really been a shift towards more off-the-block chain transactions, right, and, uh, like with merchant backends and stuff, and with, um, with different like micropayment networks because eventually like the minor fee may end up be, or, you know, the minor fee for a transaction they'll being a very, very expensive thing, right? So shift towards um, off the blockchain transactions for microtransactions to keep the block size lower. Could you explain uh, this attack that happened this week on the unconfirmed transaction? Um, what day did this happen? Uh, maybe it was Tuesday where they were sending like 11,000 maybe transactions at a time. We have to a subreddit. Man, I haven't been on the internet for a couple days. <laughs> if this happens... Yeah. Can you repeat that? Sorry? <laughs> uh, there was a... Or Reddit kind of organized this sort of testing of the net Bitcoin network by sending, <coughs> exploiting something to send some 11,000 plus unconfirmed transactions at a time, trying to create a bottleneck, I think. And I think it was to try to uh, prove a point about the blockchain size changing recently. Well, that's right. EOS basically the blockchain, like, in the book, like, through traffic or something. I thought I read that that didn't have any effect on the, uh, Other than adding a lot of transactions to the queue, uh, I don't know if that's going to be. Yep. Next question. Uh, so do you think, uh, Bitcoin is an insane group? Um, as far as as far as we're aware, all the algorithm all the algorithms in, in it are not broken. There was actually a recent scare, like with, related to one of the algorithms with it, like a slightly different variation was revealed to have um, been broke or to have been broken or partially broken, right? And the fact that at the beginning of the big or development of Bitcoin, at this uh, one small thing had been changed. Right, um, all um, all of the cryptographic part or elements of Bitcoin are no, are known to save to date. I guess I was just um, mostly talking about the surveillance type because that's what the NSA is about. They're not about like particularly. So, so I, I guess what I'm just getting at is um, there's different parts of security in Bitcoin and um, privacy. The the most relevant parts of the NSA in terms of this talk. Uh, is privacy and um, it's a public blockchain. So, um, 
So, what are your thoughts on that? So with Bitcoin, you have the ability, what I think is very interesting, to be both very private and to be both very public, right? You can use single address wallets that just say transact from a single address that can be seen, be known, it could become associated with you um, if you so wish it or buy malicious means. Um, you can use wallets that generate um, other, or that use, that generate other key pairs that, um, from a base C. Right, so your base phrase, right? It would be nothing like this in the program, but it could be like "Have a nice day today," right? And then it would do mathematical operations to generate um, your branched out keys, like "Have a nice day today" times 64, "Have a nice day today" times um, 163 times x, right? And do different hashes to generate um, ones that go down the chain, and so that would add a layer of um, anonymization because as soon as Bitcoin is moved from one address to another, you have plausible deniability that's not yours um, until it's proven otherwise that you would have control over that key. Yes, I have a question. Can you explain how adding data to the blockchain works and how like, smart contracts work with the blockchain? Or do they use their own blockchain? Okay, so in the case of Counterparty, which is the, uh, the most developed um, pro or a program that adds data to the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, basically, a counterparty transaction is latched onto a Bitcoin transaction. So, uh, you can, when you make a Bitcoin transaction, you can add arbitrary data into it, right? Um, that'll be, or that won't be read um, by Bitcoin clients. However, you can see that data with the relevant client to the software or to the protocol that you're using. You also have to pay the transaction fee? Yes, you also have to pay the transaction fee. Uh, and speaking of that, you know, there's ways to, um, there are ways to um, go beyond the state to um, issue or to issue assets um, to get uh, to get people to invest, you know, invest in you and your ventures. Counterparty is distributed exchange protocol, right? Um, you buy counterparty and you. Or, and you use that to um, issue uh, different tokens. Like it, a token can represent, um, it could represent your car, it could represent, um, it could represent a share in your business, it could represent um, any number of type of investment, right? You just have to provi or provide a signed cryptographic proof um, of what it is. That's um, the protocol or mitigates the counterparty risk of the exchange factor, right? Once an exchange is agreed upon, it is automatically executed in the next block, but it does not mitigate the counterparty risk that um, you or whoever you're buying a token from will fulfill, uh, will you know, be true to their word on the issuance of that token, right? It will build up their business and um, help you both prosper, or they will fulfill on the trade of the physical or that, that they've tightened for. Um, and so this is a, so this is a way to finance yourself um, outside of the reign, uh, outside of the reins of the government. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, let's see, any phone stuff or any computer stuff? Can you um, can you talk a little bit about things like trustless escrow and how transactions? Well, I personally don't know too much about trustless escrow. I know but, that works. Okay. So basically, it's like double entry escrow. Like, um, if I'm selling you something and you don't trust that I'm going to ship it to you, like I deposit the value of that product and like Bitcoin into like escrow, and then you also deposit like 10 percent. I mean, the value plus 10 percent, so that um, once I ship it to you and you receive it, then you have an incentive to declare that you received it and say that yes, I got it. Therefore, when my deposit actually comes back to me. So I get my money back. 
I'm actually paying, you know, the, pro the value of the product plus the value of the item in Bitcoin, and that escrow, that comes back to me. And also, um, you get your 10% back, because you pay like 110%, and that gives you an incentive to rate the merchant. So, you get your 10% back, you rate the merchant, and then everybody gets their money back. And if, like, I don't ship it to you, then I lose the actual value of the product. So, it behooves me to actually ship it to you. All right, that was trust us, escrow explained. Um, one of the, big, the biggest deficiencies, <laughs> one of the biggest deficiencies in cryptography is a lack of protocols for arbitration, right? Um, arbitration is a very hard thing to figure out cryptographically because generally it requires a human element, right? Uh, there are way, you know, in some transactions there are ways to prove they occurred, but if it, you're trying to uh, engage in a truly um, anonymous transaction, then there should be no way to confirm it happened. So that's where, in, um, you know, some of the issues of arbitra or arbitration or cryptographic arbitration uh, would come into play. Um, so that's it. Uh, with Bitcoin, there are not. Oh yeah, I just had a question. Um, like, do you know when Bitcoin will implement the features of like Dirtcoin or um, Zerocoin to make it more anonymous? Um. I do not know that. Um, as far as like Bitcoin, or as far as Bitcoin core development goes, right? Um, I pay or I pay attention to the general news of it, but you know, not too not too into the specific of the when's and the how how or how how is it going to happen? Because you know, I, I myself I'm not a developer, right? And even if I were. Uh, I'm not sure I would have enough pull, you know, on the Bitcoin or on the Bitcoin GitHub to know, or know and understand when, you know, these types of changes would go into play. But like a, tri or a big change like that would take a very would take a very long time to achieve consensus for it. I know that much. Uh, so uh, a recent advancement in, with Bitcoin is the advent of multi-signature wallets. Um, multi-signature wallets are a way that you can have joint payments with other people, right? Um, a multi-signature wallet can be two of two, it can be two of three, it can be three of five, four of five, um, it can be two of five, it can be pretty much any combina reasonable combination that you want, right? So uh, the most common um, multi-signature multi wallet application I'm aware of is CoPay by BitPay. Um, I've got that one on myself. Um, I like it. Um, you can use a local key or completely local key uh, or local account with it, or you can have it on um, BitPay's cloud, right? So those are two different levels of privacy available to you. Two you different levels of data ownership. Can, can you go into some more detail about what that? So you have that on your phone. What, what are you using for? Um, you can use it for different or for different um, transactions where you have to trust somebody. Do something say like. If you were to pay out a contractor or an employee, right? Um, you give some, or you give somebody. Um, so the contractor would have a key that they can sign and say, "Okay, I got the work done." And either you or somebody you delegate the authority to, or you mutually, you know, say is all right. Um, would also have, or you know, one of the two of you would have to sign that it's okay for the transaction to go through, right? Because it's a two or three wallet, right? And you can do broader, like with um, with board decisions for businesses, right? You know, you could do like a three of five, um, a five of seven, right? You can expand it outward with any majority or minority. Oh, so it's like a multi-user kind of check on transactions. Yeah. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah, it's like a shared bank account. But you could use it for like a family setting, like you know, if you have a wallet that's parents' wallet, they have the kid have access. Yeah, and that's actually a really good application of it. You know, parents that want to see and like or take care of their kids' spending, right? The kid could have or could have access to a multi-signature wallet with them joined to it. And then when they request money, they're like, "Yeah, okay, here you go. Have some Bitcoin. Let the transaction go through." The, the amount of signatures on that transaction, can that scale infinitely? Like, could you use that in a direct democracy situation where everybody, we have a live vote return? And yeah, you actually can, you can actually scale that up pretty big. Can you repeat this question so we can hear it? 
Okay, his question was like, how how large can this be scaled up, right? How long can this like multi-signature system be scaled up? Um, it can be scaled up as large as um, the block size will allow based on the biggest transaction you can put in with a multi-signature wallet, or you know, the multi-signature transaction, right? Um, so you could really, along with chain multi-signature transactions, you could really um, achieve a system of government or of governance using it or using multi-signature system, and that's another way to manage things um, outside of the, or outside of the state. Um, and so, um, I would say that multi-signature wallets uh, in the future will be a very good way for management and organizations, right? Um, a lot of the trend with big or with Bitcoin is that it's not really being advertised as the front end of things. It's more so or going to be powering a lot of the back end stuff. Um, BitPay actually did a pivot recently. Um, BitPay is switched from doing Bitcoin payment processing as their main thing to Bitcoin based like bank or bank to bank tools and stuff for the financial sector. Um, there is a um, there's a remittance app that has come out recently called Abra, right? Um, you can, it's like the Uber money. You go and deposit money with tellers anywhere, and it can be sent anywhere in the, wor or anywhere in the world to anybody that has the app, and they can withdraw from their local currency, but the entire back end of it is powered by Bitcoin, right? They don't really say it, but it's there. Um, you have Stripe, one of, the most powerful, or one of the most popular payment processors, right? You integrate Stripe in your site, and even or it's got all the credit cards and you have two line or two lines of code and you can add Bitcoin to your, or, you know you can add Bitcoin to your checkout process. Um, so Bitcoin is showing up more and more um, on the back, or on the back end of things, and you can really take or you can really take advantage of that the, on the wider or acceptance and integration and the wide, or wider privacy applications of this in your life. You see, because the public, public private key cryptography system of Bitcoin is superior to the single key cryptography system of credit cards, right? Uh, if for no other reason you use Bitcoin, you should use it for online payment safety. When you send a credit card number, there's information given about you. Um, somebody has a credit card number, it can be charged any number of times. doesn't necessarily mean the transaction will be confirmed and go through, but there's still a possibility of making that charge. Um, because that's a single key. Once you have it, you use it again and again and again. Um, and with Bitcoin, you are safe from that because it's public private. Um, what about some more technologies from a communication or organizational point of view? Like you, want, you want to plant something, but you want it to be quiet until the events, or you want to be communicating in real time more securely. Okay, so. Um, another application that I can recommend for uh, encrypted communications is Telegram, right? Um, all the applications I'm recommending, it's like different levels, it's different layers of security, right? Text Secure, um, it takes care of text messages that's coming in through your phone number, right? Um, Wicker is for your really secret stuff because it deletes after a certain set amount of time. And Telegram is for your generally safe stuff, right? It's all encrypted, but there is an encrypted copy of your conversation on the cloud. Doesn't this, or it doesn't mean that they have your keys, though. This project is also open source, and it's available uh, on iOS and Android, right? Um, and you can also start one-to-one -one, like extra secret chats on Telegram. Uh, there's two other apps that you should uh, talk about. Here. One is um, for Android, is Astroid. Cipher, that's by the Guardian Project. It's, um, it's an encrypted node, basically. Yeah, and what's it? That's also available through the Play Store, but what? Yes, what about Signal by Google, uh, Whisper Systems? Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. Um, Signal oh, communicates both with Red, or with Red, or it also communicates with Red Phone um, on Android, so that's great. Uh, I don't know, like, their goal was to make Signal a single application for both the text messages um, and the calls. I don't know if they've integrated the text message part yet, uh, but it'd be really great to see it soon. Yeah. Uh, so, if you're planning events, I don't know, uh, actually, there is an encrypted calendar service and 
clock by Open Whisper Systems um, can allow you to coordinate a calendar, can coordinate set of contacts as well. Yes. Yeah. How do you feel about uh, applications that allow for messaging on like a, a mesh type of network, like fire chat and things like that? They got some promise on the top or some of the work. Yeah, so a uh, mesh networking is a very important concept because um, it, or it's kind of a risk of de-escalation, right? Um, the more limited the network you're talking on, the less chance that your message can be compromised, as long as you're good at using good encryption standards. Um, so an application that uses mesh networking for chat is FireChat. Um, and is FireChat encrypted? No. No, it's not. Well, well, it's not encrypted. You know, it's a more local type. Of, it's a more local type of thing. So, like, in in the right scenarios, it is a it is a risk de-escalation, provided that there is no or that there would be no malicious agents, which in some situations is very unlikely. I gave a talk on mesh networking yesterday, and one of the key points was that like. Concept of decentralization isn't necessarily about security. It's about like moving the central points of control. So putting them together is a really good idea. But like um, mesh networking can be really beneficial in conjunction with encryption. And that's I think that's really important. Yeah, you know, uh, these thing, or these two things work work really well together. Like, I think um, cryptography is one of the biggest things that has to be thought of moving forward for mesh networking and for Internet of Things applications, right? Uh, it's kind of sad to see that a lot of medical equipment uh, doesn't have any strong encryption associated with it. You know, you can have network, or you can have network IV drips that are susceptible to being hacked and people just arbitrarily changing doses and harming patients. Uh, because this is not protected, right? So cryptography is very important um, and did, or for all sorts of things uh, in today's world. I have like a general uh, question about being NSA proof and if that's possible or if we should be thinking more along the lines of being NSA expensive. Um, yeah, so I would say being NSA proof is like explicit is would be an explicitly explicitly difficult thing to do. Are you prepared to drop all your electronics and move out into the wilderness? Right? Uh, they've got <laughs> one person. Yeah. Um, they you know they've got way um, they've got way more money than you. They've got way more manpower than you. So if they want to compromise you, I do believe they will. That said, um, all this will protect, or protect you from a broad spectrum of surveillance, and really, you should um, you should focus on risk re risk reduction, right? Um, because even um, even if right um, you or even if somebody or even if they attempt to uh, um, break your messages, right? The fact that you are the fact that you are contributing to the central um, as long as you, as long as you're you know the majority of what you're saying. Is, um, benign stuff, right? Um, from most message system, or most good, or most good message encryption systems, if you break one message, you have um, forward secrecy, where the next message won't be able to be broken. So it takes quite a lot of time and power to break the next message. Yeah. OPSEC is like, where where would you start if you were Edward Snowden right now and you had like one day of anonymity to go out and, and start over with your OPSEC? Where would you start? Like, I know checksums and all sorts of stuff, there's things I should be doing, but it's, you know. So, operation security, like, at, at its base, I would say the most important part of your operation security is having good past phrases, right? And having a good awareness of the people around you and how they present risk to you, right, and to your operation. Uh, what information they know, um, et cetera, right? Um, while you know, while using services online, a lot of them have security questions, right? Stuff like, "What was your first dog's name?" Oh, well, my entire elementary school class knows that. Uh, a couple of my friends, a couple of my friends now know that. Um, I, was, I was drunk and I was crying and I yelled it at my neighbor one night, and now they've got one part of the information they need to get into an account of mine, 
right? So uh, the most fundamental part of operation security is addressing the risk of human fallibility. So, you mentioned a lot of great software, like the Whisper system development and Microsoft Signal, but it seems like all this is predicated on the notion that you have a secure hardware. Um, and, you know, listening to developers like Jacob uh, Applebaum talk, it seems like, at least with almost all modern cell phones, uh, these are all essentially slaves to the cell network chips that are embedded in them. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe just comment on the possibility that, you know, while all these software is great, you know, <laughs> the assumption that it may make your phone secure might be able to disguise it in this context. That, that's kind of why we like the Raspberry Pi as much as we do, because that's, you know, even down to the processor architecture, you can see how that works. Yeah. And somebody who knows that can figure out you know, hey, this thing's got some weird backdoor possibility in it, and that sort of thing. Um, if you have, say, closed, like, some protected, you know, IP on that, then you have the possibility of there being a backdoor. And uh, so basically, in a computer, you have the, the very good possibility of both your hard drive and the processor both having backdoors in their firmware or in their architecture is a very real idea, or very real possibility, rather. So, we have, we have um, yeah, just more open source hardware, like, even at the base level would be the key thing. Sorry for stealing that. No, no, that's, uh, a, that's actually perfectly fine. You know, you got a good explanation there. But yeah, so, unfortunately, you know, you don't really have control of the hardware that you have, right? So, um, like, on a, presum or on a presumptive basis, it's terrible to presume. Like, you can presume that, like, your hardware is insecure, but your communications method are, um, can be, are, is secure. You don't necessarily, um, depending upon the data that would be able to be drawn from um, how the hardware is compromised, right, you may have some element of security, right? So even if your hardware is compromised, um, it is still good to, try, or to attempt to use some, if not several, layers of security. Uh, and, you know, if available, open source hardware, you know. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else got a question? I was going to say, uh, if, there, if you're still um, concerned about securely passing a message to someone or, say, a key to someone, and you're willing to wait, say, a couple of days, you could, I mean, have the biggest drug trafficker right now in the U.S. is the USPS. <laughs> You know, you can send things through there anonymously, essentially, like, hey, just send me your passphrase for this to decrypt it. And so you don't have to include it in a digital transaction that can be snooped on. You send it old school, uh, yeah, sure, it takes a little longer. Uh, or you can come up with maybe an algorithm and you do uh, a joint, you know, like, what's the, the be sure to drink your oval team kind of thing, you know, like, you know, come up with the, the Actually, speaking of um, hand cipher algorithms, um, there is actually a really good or good hand cipher algorithm. Um, does anybody in here by chance have a deck of cards? No. Nah, well, you do. I'm not exporting it, so it's okay. <laughs> Alright, so this is a deck of cards here. I'm going to shuffle it real quick. I got it. So I just shuffled this um, deck of cards a little bit. And so you can determine, the, or you can determine a common set of rules um, between you and the person you're exchanging a mess message with of how you want to do it, right? Uh, basically, the cards in the deck are ace through king, right? Uh, there are three suited cards, so, or no, there are three um, face cards, so, you know, jack, or jack, queen, king, so it's basically one through 13, right? So you could say um, one through 13 is black, you could say 14 through 26 
is red, right? And use that for your um, and use that for your addition, right? You could also say um, that uh, like um, diamonds are uppercase, and you could um, say that hearts are lowercase, if you like, right? Um, for that added or for that added bit of entropy, right? Um, well, actually, you would do do that added bit of entropy in that hand cipher, but if you wanted to have that distinguishment in your message. Uh, that said, so the first card here, right, uh, is the, uh, the second card. The first card here is the three of clubs, right? So if my first letter was, or three, three of, wait, yeah, no, it's the three clubs. Okay. Yeah, three clubs. Um, so if I had the three clubs here, right, um, the black is one through 13. If I had my letter F, I would go F, E, G, uh, H, right? Um, then I would write down H, and that is an encrypted letter. Then the next one I would go uh, is two of clubs, right? So my letter could be R, like my message could be like Fred is a nice guy, right? Um, so R, R is T U, and so U would be my next letter that I have there, and I would go. Uh, I keep going on through the deck, right? And you would able to be, or you would able to be able to send secure um, and cipher messages between anybody um, in the world as long as they had an identical or an identical shuffle in the deck, right? And chances are, unless they're like super aware of this, or like some post guy opens it up and starts playing cards with or playing cards with your um, encryption key deck, right? That you'll be able to keep this secure, um, even if even in prison. You know, in prison, um, card, or decks of cards are one of the standard things um, that are in the commissary. You can have several decks of cards, um, and officers aware of this are aware of the system, and it could not, not really be able to have have the cipher things um, because they are, or because uh, the amount of time, or because the amount of time it takes, or to be able to associate a deck of cards with a specific message um, before you start using. Um, different decks of, or different shuffle patterns um, for different people, right? So you can actually kind of use this. Uh, you can actually use this deck of cards here as a single key encryption system. If somebody comes and shuffles your deck, you hope. Yeah, if your if your deck gets shuffled, then you'll have to generate a new common key, uh, which would generally or which would be best done, you know, in person. Right, you stack up two decks, um, but there's also that nice factor of if you shuffle the deck, the key is gone. Right, your messages can't be decrypted, or your prior messages can't be decrypted anymore. Um, if you just have the encrypted messages there, right, so that or gives you, um, so that gives you forward secrecy. Do you have a summary of all the apps and uh, resources you can talk about? Okay, so PGP. Is on every platform on this, or you know, on every computing platform on this planet. Uh, you can use it on your phone, on Android. There's APG. Um, I don't know about PGP for iPhone, but it's probably there. Um, then there's also GPG on Android, on your computer, Windows, Linux, um, and Mac. I recommend GPG. That is the open source version of PGP. Um, and that is something that's written out that I can. Oh, written yeah. out. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if it's real. Yeah. Um, I have an issue. I have an issue with my. Or I have an issue with my slides. Uh, but I'll have them online on my website, and I actually have business cards that for all you guys, so you can check it out. And yep. Um, what about um, keypads? Um, um, keypads like password management software. Yeah. Okay. So password management. Um, is a very key thing, right? Uh, a lot of people, or a lot of um, people who are into cryptography, like to talk about password and or talk a lot about password entropy and really focus on it and the length of it. Um, but the biggest problem you have is password commonality, using the same password across multiple services, because there's multiple chances that that password can be compromised, right? Um, so um, you should have some 
um, strategy of active pass or password management. Um, if you have to use a um, if you have to use a password management software where you have a key for it or a single key for it, and you have a list of passwords in it, um, if that's thing. Then make sure your your um, entry password has a very high level of entropy and it's known only by you and the depths of the safe deposit box in case you die. Right. Um, there, I do believe there's also a lot of uh, systems that have two-factor authentication with different token, or with you know different physical tokens or applications, and where or where possible, it's always preferable to use two-factor authentication uh, because that gives you an added layer of control over everything you do. Uh, go ahead. Do you know anything about password management software, and in particular the one called OnePassword? Uh, Are you familiar with? Um, I'm familiar, like I'm familiar with it, and I've tried it out with, in the past. Um, personally, like I don't use a, a password management software, right? I just keep it, or I just keep it all to my head. So um, that's it. Like if, if it's a thing, if it's a thing that you you need and it's useful to you and it helps you be more security conscious, then I would fully, you know, then I'd say take that step and use it. Um, you know, as long as it's verified and secure. Um, so other than maybe, you maybe said you had a website, um, is there a clearinghouse or a website that, that kind of goes over a lot of the things you talked about here, lists all these yeah. applications? Um, I think it's TechCrunch that does the Who's Got Your Back report, right? Um, so if you look up the Who's Got Your Back report, it'll show you um, a list of different software development companies that build tools um, that have your back. And I'm That's yeah. Oh, my bad. Electronic Front Peer Foundation. I screwed up on that. It's on my slides. All right. Well, have a nice day, everybody. Dude, dot com.